WDAF, Kansas City. Dan Henry, WDAF Local News at 11. The outlook for Kansas City, a chance for thunder showers. Kansas City, Missouri police have one suspect in custody in connection with a shooting on the street at 33rd and Troost. Two women were injured. They have been identified as 30-year-old Joan Oglesby of 2139 East 15th in Kansas City and General Hospitalists, her condition as critical, with gunshot wounds in the chest and stomach. The other is identified as K. Sue Hammond of 5814 Olive in Kansas City. Hospital authorities say she is in fair condition with gunshot wounds in the pelvic area and right leg. The identity of the suspect in custody in connection with the incident is not known. Police are still investigating. A class action suit against the Kansas City, Missouri Board of Education and the Kansas City Teachers Union has been filed on the docket of U.S. District Court Judge Elmo Hunter. The suit was filed on behalf of his sons by the father of two boys who attend Southwest High School, asking the judge to order schools opened and teachers to halt the strike. A hearing was set for April 25th. Norman Hudson, president of the Kansas City Teachers Union, sits in jail tonight, his first in a 10-day contempt of court sentence. And all negotiations between teachers and the board are being handled by a federal mediator. In Kansas City, Kansas, teacher talks are to resume immediately, according to Superintendent of Schools Dr. O.L. Plucker. But negotiations between the NEA, representing Shawnee Mission teachers and that district school board, appear to have been stalemated, with teachers apparently demanding more than the 10.5% increase reportedly offered by the board. WDAF News Time, 11 o'clock. of the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is Richard Wall from Los Angeles and at this hour, some black police officers in San Francisco have joined the protest against the stop and search policy in the Operation Zebra hunt for the killer of 12 whites. A member of the group, Officer Jesse Bird, announced, We are just as much concerned about the apprehension of this individual or individuals as anyone else. But we do not approve of the Gestapo type tactics that are being used. Right we, do not we do not approve of people being stopped and frisked at random. We can only view this as another type of harassment. Officer Bird's objection came as five black civic leaders filed a class action suit saying the tactics of searching blacks who match the zebra killer's description in San Francisco are unconstitutional. A Statue of Liberty takeover. That story coming up. children in the United States who should be running, laughing, and playing are coughing, wheezing, and choking. Six million boys and girls are suffering from serious lung-damaging diseases. The National Cystic Fibrosis Research Foundation needs your help to help them. In the breath of a child lies the hope of a A group calling itself the Attica Brigade has taken over the Statue of Liberty in New York and promises to stay the weekend, demanding impeachment of President Nixon and protesting what's called social injustice in the U.S. President Nixon is spending the night at Camp David in Maryland. Earlier, the president went for a dinner cruise aboard the yacht Sequoia on the Potomac and then stopped by the home of his daughter, Julie Eisenhower, in Bethesda, Maryland. Mark Felt, former associate director of the FBI, says the White House asked him to issue news releases on Watergate that he considered improper for the FBI to be involved in. Felt ran the FBI after J. Edgar Hoover's death. The defense has rested its case in the perjury conspiracy trial of John Mitchell and Maurice Stans in New York. The prosecution will present rebuttal witnesses Monday. Israel and Syria disagree on losses in the first major air battles in the Mideast since the October War. But there's a warning about the consequences of the increasing escalation of the Golan Heights fighting. Correspondent Andrew Mizell's reports from Tel Aviv. Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Dayan warned today that if the Syrians continue escalating the battle around Mount Hermon, Henry Kissinger might arrive here in 10 days to find a full-scale war in progress. Dayan issued the warning in a television interview, which I watched here in Tel Aviv. It came on the eve of the heaviest day of fighting yet, 
a day in which Israel reported its first battle losses in the air, two warplanes shot down by ground fire. They said that if Syria continued trying to capture territory, Israel would feel free to do the same. Andrew Mizell's ABC News, Tel Aviv. Japan has signed an agreement with China for mutual airline service. The nationalist Chinese on Taiwan have threatened to end their aviation agreement with Japan because of the arrangement between Tokyo and Peking. Government economist Gary Seaver says inflation will remain a serious problem in the U.S. Seaver's remark followed release of figures showing the cost of living rose 1.1% in March, raising the 12-month increase in consumer prices to 10.2%. The Chicago Tribune has an announcement of interest to nostalgia buffs. The Tribune says it will bring back the original Orphan Annie cartoon strip starting Monday. The first episode will show Annie and her dog Sandy in 1936. This is Information Radio News. From the Kurt Murs Sports Desk, the Kansas City Royals play the Chicago White Sox two more games in this series tomorrow and Sunday, then move to Boston. A temporary restraining order has been issued against the Cincinnati Bengals linebacker Bill Berge and the World Football League that keeps all WFL owners from negotiating with any member of the Cincinnati squad. Peter Oosterhaus holds the lead in the Monsanto Open Golf Tournament with a 36-hole total of 133, and the KU relays will be wrapped up tomorrow. Kansas City's forecast partly cloudy and mild with a chance for showers or thunder showers through tomorrow. After an overnight low around 60, the high tomorrow will be in the upper 70s. Dan Henry, WDAF News. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. Welcome to the fear you can hear. Welcome to the world of your own terrifying imagination. The art of the double cross, unfortunately, has become part of the fabric of our lives. In espionage, however, it is almost a lifestyle. In the world of spies, for the left hand ever to know what the right is doing is unthinkable. For the next hour, imagine that you are Larry Fielding, a 32-year-old newspaper man caught in a dizzying web of circumstances seemingly beyond his control. Larry, please change your mind and come with me. Not until you tell me who you are and why you sneaked into my hotel room. You're a fool, Larry. You must know that the police are looking for you and they'll be here any minute. Oh, well, you're here now. And I still want to know who you are. If that's so important, my name is Carol Johnson. And when I tell you I know all about the murder of Dave Wilson, maybe you'll believe that I'm here to help you. Our mystery drama, The Lady Was a Tiger, written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett, stars William Redfield. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Hi, I'm Goldilocks, Ms. Goldilocks, if you please, and I'm a professional taste tester here at my taste test laboratory. That's TTL for short. <laughs> I taste test everything from porridge to diet drinks. Actually, there's not that much taste testing in porridge these days. There used to be once upon a time. I mean, that's how this Miz got into the biz. <laughs> but lately, it's been diet drinks. I mean, with so many diet drinks going sugar-free, I've been really busy conducting taste tests. A rather unbearable assignment, to be sure. But then I discovered sugar-free diet 7-Up. Fresh, natural, delicious. My only problem is that sugar-free diet 7-Up tastes so good that it broke my Goldilocks diet drink taste meter Well, sugar-free diet 7-Up certainly has my seal of approval. This one's just right. Don't let anyone con you into thinking it's wrong to turn in a heroin pusher. You're not ratting. You're doing your part to wipe out one of the most insidious epidemics racking our country today. 
So don't let anyone kid you. If you really care about the quality of life, if you really care about improving society, you'll do everything you can to get the heroin pusher off the street and into jail where he belongs. If you have information about a drug pusher, use the heroin hotline. The number is 800-368-5363. That's toll free from anywhere in the country. The number again is 800-368-5363. A trained operator will answer your call, take your information, and pass it on to experienced federal agents who will investigate. You'll make your own special contribution toward helping us wipe out what President Nixon has called public enemy number one. Call 800-368-5363. Walking is great exercise. And with good weather can also be great fun. But not when you've just been fired by the editor of the newspaper for which you've worked happily for five years. Larry Fielding has been walking aimlessly for two hours, trying to figure out why Horace Finley, the editor and his boss, had refused to give him any reason for his dismissal. Tormented by his frustrating thoughts and tired, Larry sits down on a park bench to think. He is so deep in thought, he is unaware of three men who suddenly surround him. Larry has only to look at them to know that he is in trouble. He tries to get up, but is pushed back down, and the men start to beat him up. No, no, take, take my money and leave me alone, will you? Look, if, if you want money, I uh, it told you, you, you can have it. Help! Help! Calling for help when you're being mugged in a big city park is sometimes as helpful as trying to catch hold of a windowsill in a 30-story fall. But this time, there was a miracle. A stranger has seen the attack and rushes to help. Hang in there, young man! Here comes... That's a nice joy you have there, fella! You need a lesson of chicken! Oh, it took care of them. Uh, They're gone. Oh, thanks. Uh, let me help you up. Thanks. Thanks, mister. Thanks a lot, I tell you. I was in real trouble. My pleasure. Did they get your wallet? I don't know. I... No, no, no. I got a lot of bruises, but they didn't get a thing. Say, you're a pretty good scrapper for a... For a guy my age. Well, yeah, yeah. Hey, what are you, a karate expert? Oh, just keep myself in shape. You sure do. Listen, can I do something for you to show you I really meant thanks? You certainly can. How about coffee? Oh, sure, sure, but, but that's nothing. What, what I meant was... Uh, I, I mean... know what you meant. My name's Dave Wilson. Oh, good. I'm, uh, I'm Larry Fielding. Oh, come on, Larry. Let's have a cup of coffee. I still can't get over the way you tore into those guys. I was a commando in World War II. World War II? <laughs> Did you think I was in the Civil War? No, no, I didn't mean that. It's just... Well, to a young fellow like you, World War II might as well have been in the last century. It was only 30-some-odd years ago, you know. Oh, I know, I know. After all, I was in the newspaper business. Yeah. You know, that stuff which you told me about losing your job. What are you going to do? Oh, I don't know. Look around for another one. What bothers me is the way my editor let me go. No explanations. You know, we were friends. You'd think he'd at least tell me why he fired me. Those things happen. Ah. Stop torturing yourself and begin making plans. No, not until I get this thing straightened out in my own mind. I think I'll call my editor at home tonight and... Uh... I've got a better idea. <laughs> go out and get drunk, huh? Nope. How about a trip to Paris? <laughs> are you putting me on? I'm serious. Well, what are you... A scout for contestants for some kind of TV quiz show? <laughs> no. I am a man sitting on a couple of hundred thousand dollars. What? And I need a guy just like you. Now, look. Look, I'm a newspaper man. 
Anytime a stranger starts talking about a trip to Paris and a couple of hundred thousand dollars, I, uh... Walk away without even listening? Yeah. Even if the man just happened to maybe save you from being mugged, robbed, and beaten up? Okay. All right. I'll listen. But believe me, that'll be it. Fair enough. First, here's my card. Oh. Uh, David Wilson Calridge Imports. I never heard of him. You can call and check me out. I told you I was in World War II. Oh, look. I'm grateful to you, but you're wasting your time. Why don't you shut up and listen? You've probably heard about the millions of dollars in artworks and precious jewels that the G.I.s liberated during the last days of the war. Liberated, sure, yeah. Well, I've heard stories. Well, most of them are true. One that I know in particular certainly is. Did you ever hear of the Lancer collection? Lancer, Lancer. The no, Comte no. de Lancer came from an old French family. And the Lancer collection is a fabulous assortment of diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and other precious stones which were seized by the Nazis when they swept through France in 1940. A pal of mine, not a commando, happened to come upon the collection when the Americans were driving the Germans back in 44. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he liberated it? Exactly. He and a distinguished Frenchman named Henri Thiel. Oh. Professor Henri Thiel? The archaeologist? That's the man. Oh, come on. He wouldn't... Uh... You were saying something? No, nothing. You were about to say he wouldn't get involved in anything crooked, weren't you? Yeah, something like that. You're right, he wouldn't. But he was younger. The world was quite different then. And my G.I. pal was a most persuasive guy. They decided to bury the Lancer collection. They did. They drew a map. And today, Professor Teal is the only possessor of that map. Uh-huh. And, uh, what happened to your nameless friend? He's dead. Professor Teal wants to return to Jules. <laughs> but that's easy, isn't it? Not if the professor doesn't want embarrassing questions asked about how he came by that app in the first place. Oh. What about you? Calridge Imports is a highly respected and reputable importing firm. I want to keep it that way. Oh, so do I, even though I've just been fired. You haven't heard what I'm asking you to do. Well, what? Come with me to Paris. You're writing a story on Professor Teal. He's good material. You'll grant me that. Yes, yes. You'll interview him, naturally. During the course of that interview, he'll give you a slip of paper, which is a map showing the location of the jewels. You'll later deliver it to me. And that's all you have to do. You, um, mentioned something about sitting on hundreds of thousands of dollars? That's right. The Lancer collection is worth that and more. I'm sitting on it. I intend to return the jewels... And collect a reward. If you want to share in that, you deserve it. This is Wilson. The report is positive. Fielding has agreed to go to Paris with me. He bought the story about picking up a map showing the location of the Lancer collection. Operation successful. You'd better be on your way, Larry. You're due at Professor Teal's in ten minutes. Oh, I suppose it's uh, too late to back out, huh? You can always back out, Larry, but I don't think you will. There's really nothing to it. Make it look like a normal interview. Take notes. The professor will give you the map. Slip it in with your notes. Bring it back to me here. I'll be waiting. Um, okay. Larry. Yes? Relax. Oh, sure thing. I'll see you. Would monsieur mind if I join him? I wouldn't mind at all, but I don't think I'm what you're looking for. Oh, but monsieur is exactly what I seek. Exactly. And just what is it you're seeking? To warn you that you are in grave danger. Why don't you come off it with that phony accent? If you've got something to say to me, say it. Would monsieur buy me a Pernod? Sure. Garçon, Pernod, please. Monsieur, it is very difficult for me. I do play a role, as you have guessed. And I am not here by chance. You must leave, and quickly. Uh, your Pernod, monsieur. Not for me. It's for the lady. And uh, for you, 
I have a knife. No. <gasps> oh. But she's going to die. Do as I say. There'll be no problem. Simply put his head down gently on the table. So. And people will see another drunken tourist. <laughs> Your name is Larry Fielding. You're 28 years old, and you're feeling marvelous. You have just completed a fascinating interview with Professor Henry Teal, and you have the paper that you're going to hand over to your friend who's waiting at Les Deux Magots. You see him at the table where you left him. His head is down, but you're not concerned. Dave, Dave, wake up. I saw the professor. What? Monsieur, what has happened? Well, I don't know. I, I came back to meet my friend. He, I, I guess he's passed uh, out. A moment, monsieur. Look, this man has been murdered. What? Stabbed to death. You will wait here for the police. I will. I, I will not. I'm getting out of here. Who is there? It is I. Open up. What's the matter? What happened? The other American. The young one. He got away. You let him go? He panicked. Ran. Now what? He'll probably go back to his room at the Dauphin. You will check. But aren't the police looking for him? I hope so. I gave them a complete description. And what do I say to them if they find me in his room? Come, a beautiful young lady like yourself. Get to him and find out where the paper is. Promise not to scream. Right, right. Okay. Now, why have you picked the lock in my room? Never mind. You have to get out of here. Not until you tell me who you are. If that matters, my name is Carol Johnson. I've been sent here to help you. Oh, sure. I know about the murder of your friend. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Sent by whom? I'll answer your questions while we're on the way. On the way to where? Safety. I don't need to run. I didn't kill anybody. I'm not about to take off with a strange girl, particularly not one who's equipped with skeleton keys. Oh, suit yourself. Goodbye. Come in. Monsieur de Rancidine. Yes? Inspector Victor Roux, Surete. Oh, you would please come with me. Oh, what for? Suspicion of murder of another American? Monsieur David Wilson. Hey, Inspector, listen. Why would I kill Dave? I've already told you I had an appointment to meet Dave at the cafe. He was waiting for me. Would I have walked up to a man i just killed and shake him so that he'd fall down and make a big scene? That is your explanation. There is nothing to support it. Yes, well, there's nothing against it either. There is the word of Louis Gouret. Louis Gouret. Who's he? The waiter who attended the table at which Monsieur Wilson and you sat. Oh. The only reason that you are not, as of this moment, charged with murder is because you did return. That much the waiter's testimony supports. Only he says that Monsieur Wilson might very well have been dead shortly after you returned. And that you had time to kill him. That's a lie. So you say. Oh, just check with Professor Teal. He'll tell you what time I arrived, what time I left. We have been trying. And there has been no answer. Ah, we may have him on the telephone now. Hello? Eh? Ah? So? Well, eh bien. Merci. All right, well, what did he say? That was not Professor Teal. That was his apartment. And his servant. His servant? There was nobody there when I saw him. Don't you mean if you saw him, monsieur? Oh. According to the servant, Professor T left for an extended holiday early this morning. And it is not known when he is expected back. Your name is Larry Fielding. You're 32 years old. And you find yourself in prison in Paris accused of murder. 
You know you've been had, and you're dealing with forces that seem beyond your control. You have a million questions, and the only man who could answer them is the man you're accused of killing. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. When you drink beer, do you tilt the glass for long, hearty swallows? Or just tip it and sip it? Well, sipping's the thing for wine. But Budweiser beer is a hearty drink, brewed for zest and character. The best way to enjoy Bud is to drink it. Not chug a lug, just man-sized beer drinker swallows. That's when that famous Budweiser taste, smoothness, and drinkability really come through. Smoothness and drinkability that come only from natural carbonation and exclusive beechwood aging. Smoothness and drinkability, too good for any half-hearted sipping. So drink up. You'll see that brewing beer right does make a difference. And that when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. In 1919, someone had a big idea. Let's help youth understand big business by starting them in small businesses of their own. And Junior Achievement was born. Each group elected a board of directors, chose a product, set up a production line, sold stock, and went into business. That year, 314 students made and sold products and learned the business of business. <laughs> Today, Junior Achievement has grown to nearly 200,000 members. Junior Achievers are designing and marketing their own products and services, from cutting boards to printing. They're organizing sales efforts, writing marketing plans, calculating profit and loss. Running these small businesses helps Junior Achievers understand how big business works. Support Junior Achievement, where youth learns the business of business. Call your local Junior Achievement office. Americans, Paris means visits to the Louvre, strolls along the Seine, or fine food. But to Larry Fielding, it means the inside of a prison cell, where he sits accused of a murder he didn't commit. Fielding knows he's been caught up in something that involves more than the recovery of some stolen jewels. However, what he doesn't realize is that he's the key pawn in a deadly game and the players are about to make some moves. Go. I don't think it's smart to have me come here so often. I would not have sent for you if it were not necessary. Do you still believe that Fielding knows nothing about the operation? I do. Then where's the document? Well, we don't know he ever had it, do we? We know he visited Teal. We know that Wilson waited for him at Le Dubago. We know he came back there. I think it is safe to assume that he was carrying the plans. And he didn't have it on him when he was arrested. Roger arranged to be there when Fielding was brought in and searched. He says there was nothing on him. But he wasn't picked up right away. Exactly. He eventually went back to his hotel room, as you know. I believe he has the paper and that he has somehow managed to hide it. Oh. It does us no good in prison. We shall have to arrange to have him released. And how do we do that? We don't. You do. Sit down, mademoiselle. Your passport says Carol Johnson. That's right, Inspector. And I am told you are in my office because of the... unfortunate incident in the Café Les Deux Magots. Yes, Inspector. I... I just had to come here to tell you 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 have the wrong man. Ah? And how do you know that? I'm studying at the Sorbonne. I visit Les Deux Magots all the time. I was sitting right there when that man was murdered. Formidable. You saw a man murdered and you did nothing. Oh, at the time I didn't know it was a murder. I just thought the man had too much to drink or was ill. 
But the reason I know that you've arrested the wrong man is that the murdered man was dead before this young American Fields or... or uh, Fielding. Yes, well, the man was dead before Fielding ever got to the table. Fielding came and shook him. And that was when it was discovered that he was dead. I'm prepared to swear to that, Inspector. Of course you are prepared to swear to this uh, story that you have just told me. Why not? It's the truth. Of course, mademoiselle. Why would a beautiful young lady like yourself lie to an inspector of the surete? I'm not sure that I like the way you say that, Inspector. But everything will be all right if you release young Fielding. You have told me you will swear to this statement of yours in court. Therefore, I have very little choice. Ah, oh, good. But, mademoiselle... I have been the police officer for 20 years, long enough to know that witnesses who appear late with an alibi for an accused murderer often have reason. Oh, that's for... ridiculous. And I also wish to warn you, mademoiselle, that the Surate considers this a very much open case. <laughs> that is the business of the Surete. Au revoir, Inspector. Gérard, you will follow the young lady who just left my office and do not lose her. Hello there. Oh, it's you. <laughs> Want to give me a lift? Well, I suppose I owe you something for getting me out of jail. Taxi! Taxi! Uh, yeah, there, we got one. Uh, yes. Hop in. Oh, thanks. Uh, driver, Hotel Dauphine. Well, you look pretty good for a jailbird. You look pretty good yourself for... Come to think of it, what are you? An American girl in Paris trying to make a living. What are you? An American in Paris in need of a bath, a drink, and some food. You know, you're not bad looking. Oh, thanks. While we seem to be exchanging compliments, can I say you're about the best-looking girl I've seen since I've been here? <laughs> Thank you. Now that we like each other so much, don't you think it's time we started telling each other the truth? Mm, yes, I'll buy that. Uh, Écoutez-moi, uh, operator. Uh, well, never... You speaking? Okay. Well, look, I phoned the desk about an hour ago to get this room straightened up, and so far nothing's happened. Now, can you please just send someone up so I can sleep here tonight? Huh? Oh, while you're uh, at it, where's our food? Uh, wait, uh, wait a minute. That's a different department. Oh. I'll have to call room service again. Oh. Maybe you won't have to bother. Oh. Uh, entrée. You want dinner, monsieur? Madame? Ah. Uh, merci. Monsieur would like me to sell. No, no, thanks. No, I think I can handle it myself. As monsieur wishes. Uh, wait a minute. Don't I know you? I think not, monsieur. Now, we are. I've seen you before. I'm sure I've seen you. Uh, Paris is a large city, monsieur. One passes people on the streets. And... This is the streets. The streets, that's it. You're the same guy who was at the Café Le Du Mago. Monsieur is mistaken. What? Hey, wait a minute. Come back here. I want to talk to you. Oh, now, don't go chasing him down the hall. Why not? Listen, Carol, I'm positive he's the same waiter... You just deny it and you can't prove it. But, but... Even if you could, what do you think it means? Well, it means... It means... Well, I don't know. But if I get, get, get him to talk, maybe I'd find out something. I thought you were going to clue me in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Listen... Have you ever heard of the Lancer collection? Of course. It's in the Louvre. Oh. The family of Comte de Lancer gave it to the museum after it was recovered when the Nazis fled Paris. What? Well, why does that shake you up so much? Because it can't be true. <laughs> Come with me to the Louvre and I'll show it to you. Well, that changes everything. Come on. Where are we going? To the American consul. Well? Unbelievable. What? Simply unbelievable. Do you know what the consul told me? Ah, oh, I predicted it, didn't I? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to hear about it at all. Oh. Just advised me to look up the whole thing and leave France. Incredible. Well, not really when you understand that he doesn't know what you're talking about. 
But you do. Some of it. Okay, take me back to the hotel. Any reason? I'm taking the consul's advice. If nobody's interested, I'll go back to the States. Well, now that they've cleaned up the room so nicely, you are leaving. Well, do you have a better idea? More than one. Uh, I think I'll take them one at a time. <laughs> Number one. Give me the paper Professor Teal gave you. Well, it looks like we're finally going to level. Where is it? Well, first you tell me something. What is it? I don't know. End of conversation. Larry, listen to me. I work for Colonel Blake, military intelligence. I was assigned to this operation. What operation? All I was told was that Dave Wilson, who also works for us, was coming over here with you and that you were to get something from Professor Teal and give it to Dave. Teal worked with you, too? He did. But now his cover is blown and I don't know where he is. Who killed Wilson? I don't know. It could have been any one of three or four foreign powers. And the only reason I'm alive is because somebody wants the paper. That's right. And if I give it to you, then there's really no reason not to kill me. Oh, Give it to me. I'll get it to Colonel Blake and we'll get you safely out of the country. No, no, no. Hold on. Hold on. I got a better idea. I'll go with you to Colonel Blake and we'll give it to him together. No, that would be too dangerous. To whom? Will you please trust me? Give me a reason. Please. Where is the paper? I... I burned it. You expect me to believe that? Why not? You expect me to believe everything you tell me? You admit you had the paper. And somehow, between the time you ran from Les Demagos, you managed to hide it in a place where experts have been unable to find it. I told you I burned it. And you know that's a fairy tale that no one will believe. I don't care whether you believe it or not. Now, are you coming with me? Where? To talk to your Colonel Blake. He won't see you. Oh, 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 I think he will. Goodbye, Carol. It was nice knowing you. I think... You will kindly step back into your room, Monsieur Philly. Now, wait a minute. Move. Let me introduce myself. I am Major Simonovich. Oh. Of the Gay Payou or the NKVD? It does not really matter. What matters is that you and I have something to discuss. I warned you. Yeah, sure you did. Just like a rattlesnake does. I do so dislike dealing with amateurs. This is strictly a business. You mean you want to make a deal with me? Correction. I mean you would find it wise if you wanted to make a deal with us. For the paper? Exactly. Where is it? No, no, not so fast, not so fast. You spoke about a deal? You give us the paper, we give you your life. You must really believe I'm an idiot. You people murdered Wilson. That paper is the only thing that's keeping me alive. I have my word. No deal. Do you really believe you have a choice? Carol, call Rojansky. Make the usual arrangements. We will wait here. Donnez-moi 8036, s'il vous plaît. C'est ça. Merci. Carol. Yes. Tell me something. Um, will I like Rodzanski? By this time, Larry Fielding realizes that he's been used. That he was never supposed to bring Dave Wilson a paper telling the location of the Lancer Jewel Collection. But his discoveries have only added to his dilemma. He was quick-witted enough to realize that his only hope was to hide the paper, because that slip of paper is his last resort. We'll be back shortly with Act Three. Great taste in the morning. Kellogg's, Kellogg's has that wholesome taste to get you up and grinning. This is Jerry Coffer for Kellogg's Special K. We've been having some fun in our television and radio commercials by using a ball and chain to symbolize the slight overweight problem common to so many of us. We point out that being a few pounds overweight is just a little more difficult for you. Climbing stairs, just walking around, even sitting down can feel, well, like you're wearing a ball and chain. In case you missed the message, it's this. If you really want to get rid of that extra weight, you really have to work at it by exercising and with sensible meals like the Special K Breakfast. A one-ounce bowl of Special K, America's favorite high-protein cereal, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee, less than 240 calories, nutritious, and by the way, delicious. So why not begin each day with a Special K breakfast and then keep up the good work? Special K can't help you lose weight all by itself, but it really is a good start. Hi, 
I'm Hal Linden. There's a lot of talk these days about America's energy crisis. Talk about doing without heat, about doing without our cars, about what's going to happen if we run out of fuel. Well, we may not have to run out of fuel if we all work together to conserve the fuel we have. That means turning your thermostats down to 68 degrees during the day and turning them down to 60 at night. It means turning off lights, TV sets, and electrical appliances the minute we're finished with them. It means driving no faster than 50, starting or joining carpools, avoiding the kind of stop-and-go motoring that eats up gas by the gallon. In short, it means saving every ounce of energy we can, every chance we get. So please, do your part to make the fuel supply stretch a little further. For your own sake, don't be selfish. Don't be foolish. Don't be fuelish. This message from the Federal Energy Office and the Advertising Council. Newspaper man Larry Fielding sits waiting in his Paris hotel room, closely guarded by three members of the Russian secret police and the beautiful American girl, Carol Johnson. They are waiting for a man named Rosansky, who might very well be, for all Fielding knows, his executioner. You know we mean to obtain the paper. Rosansky is a doctor and a chemist. He'll be here shortly. You will be put to sleep painlessly. You'll be taken from here in an ambulance to a safe place. And there you'll be injected with sodium pentothal, Fielding. You will tell us. Look, I don't suppose you'll tell me what's so important about this piece of paper? You have heard of the SAM-6 missiles. The surface-to-air weapons with deadly accuracy that we have developed and which were used so successfully in minor wars in Asia and the Middle East? Yes, yes, I've heard of them. Good. We learned that someone whose identity we still seek has invented a jamming device which would render this M6 almost worthless. Ah. We don't believe that any such system can be invented, but we do not take chances. We have reason to believe that the piece of paper that you carried away from Professor Teal's has the information for building such a device. Ah, that will be Rojansky. Carol, admit him. Of course. Come in, Doctor. This is the patient. Now, look, I really don't think this the is necessary. It will be easier if you don't force, young man. I don't intend to make... Hold it. it. Get now, his arm. Get. Hold it still. Good. You brought a stretcher? Of course. There. He'll be under in a moment, so we can leave. <laughs> Gendarmes. It has nothing to do with us. We are taking a sick man to the hospital. Put this stretcher into the ambulance. Quickly. I must apologize, but we received a report from the hotel concierge that there was a dead man here. Absurd, Inspector. This is Dr. Jansky. The doctor will explain this to you, Inspector. This man became suddenly quite ill. I gave him a sedative to quiet him, and we're not taking him to the Lefebvre nursing home. As you can see by the ambulance. You say he is alive? Very much so. See for yourself. Huh. Mon Dieu. I know this man. Oh, Inspector, he must receive medical attention. Of course, of course. But uh, I suggest that instead of taking him to the nursing home, we go instead to the police hospital. Well, that's ridiculous. He's my patient. I am afraid I must insist. This young man has most recently been released from jail, where we were holding him on a charge of murder. If he has been released... Then Released, why? yes. But he has not been completely cleared, so... Laurent, be gone. Take this man to the police hospital. Did you get a report? Yes. And? He'll be conscious in an hour. And he will talk? I'm sure of that. He will scream to see Colonel Blake, and then your cover is blown, and the whole operation goes fooey. What do we do? Silence him. But what about the papers? Oh, we will be faulted for that, of course. But if we do not have it, neither do the Americans. Who do we have in the police hospital? Only Leclerc. A weakling. But he can admit Rosansky. 
Rozhansky's a doctor. He doesn't need Leclerc to admit him. He can visit his patient openly. Thank you, my dear. I visit Fielding and he dies shortly thereafter. That idea does not appeal to me. We have to do something. You are both right. Carol, you will be his first visitor when he regains consciousness. No. Yes, Carol. Rozhansky, give her your hypodermic kit. I don't have to do this and I won't. You would prefer that in my report... I mentioned your failure with Fielding when you had some hours alone with him. I'll go. That is wise. Rajansky, give her the syringe. Here, quickly. The car is waiting. And Carol, if you should decide or even think about changing sides, it would be most unwise. You know the French police are still most interested in the person who murdered Wilson. You awake now, Larry? Oh, I... Oh, no. Oh. Wake up and listen to me, Larry. What? You've got to listen. I... Try to understand me. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What kind of a place is this? You're safe. It's a police hospital. All right, but how did you get in here? Where's, uh, what's, uh, Rodzanski? Look, I can understand how you feel and why you don't trust me, but the truth really is that I am a double agent. Oh. Do you understand what a double agent is? As near as I can figure out, a double agent is somebody working for do two different sides. Yes. And neither side trusts them. Oh. You know, that fits you to a T. You might just be telling the truth. I am. I really work for Colonel Blake, as I told you. The Russians know it. They think I've infiltrated the U.S. military intelligence. But in yes, fact... Yes, yes, I know. You've really done just the opposite. Yes. Worked your way into the Russian apparatus. Exactly. Oh, Larry, how can I make you believe me? You can't. Listen, you were deliberately recruited. Oh. The reason you lost your job was because we got in touch with your boss. He agreed to go along. The men who jumped you were part of the setup so that Wilson could save you. Hey, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. But that, that doesn't prove a thing. You could have learned all that working for Blake and still be with the other side. And Oh. And, and, and wait, now, speaking of Wilson, how about getting him killed? I tried to warn him, but there wasn't enough time. It was either go along with that or blow my cover and endanger the whole operation. And when I wanted to give the plans to Blake, you objected. Same problem if I went with you to Blake or you went to him after we had talked. My cover was blown. All right. Now, and suppose I had given you the plans. How would that have changed the situation? We would have had a phony copy that I would have delivered to Igor and everything would have been fine. Hmm. And there's still time for me to do that. If you will just believe me and tell me where the plans are. I'd like to believe you. I really, I really would. Please, where are they, Larry? Get me to Blake. It's too dangerous. Look, you see this? Yeah, it's a hypodermic. It's death. Igor sent me here with this to kill you. Now, do you believe me? Wait, wait a minute. If you don't kill me, and I guess you don't intend to, what will Igor and his friends think? Isn't your cover blown then anyway? Could be, but if I come back with the plans and say that I got them out of you without having to kill you, there's a chance they'll believe me. Uh-huh. Well? I'm thinking. Who are you? One of the hospital guards, monsieur. Oh, Mademoiselle, you have been here some time. How is the patient? Guard. Yes, monsieur? Call Colonel Blake at U.S. Military Intelligence. Tell him I've got to see him right away on a matter of the utmost urgency. Colonel Blake? Colonel Blake. I would inform my superior. Now, you don't have to inform anyone. Just call him. Yes, monsieur. The major will be disappointed. You have not followed instructions. You are a fool. I would have had the information if you hadn't come in when you did. I know what you were ordered to do. What? What's this? A moment of truth, I'm afraid, Larry. Oh, I know how highly the Major regards you, Mademoiselle. But I also know what he thinks of me. Tonight will change that. Give me that syringe. Here, right in your arms. Oh, oh you... You traitor. I... I knew... Carol. 
about you. <gasps> you were telling me the truth. Yes. Yes, I was. And I had to kill him. To make you see it. Where is the paper, please? In my hotel room. Oh, aren't you ever going to stop playing games? You know your room was searched. Let me get dressed and I'll show you. If it's not here, there's going to be the devil to pay. Don't worry, it's here. Now, I'm the one who has to be shown. Trained operatives from two special branches went over this room with everything except Geiger counters. Okay, okay. Where are we going? The bathroom. That was searched, too. Oh, oh I don't doubt it. Oh, we went through that cabinet. Did you now? What do you see? Towels, paper tissues, some of your toilet articles. We took your razor apart. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And what else? A roll of toilet tissue. Unopened. And as the French say, mademoiselle, voila. Oh. And now we unroll this toilet tissue and keep unrolling oh. it and... Oh, my God. Where did you learn to open a package and reseal it like that? <laughs> when I was a kid, I was the best clerk in Roscoe's shipping department. Oh, thanks. It was nice knowing you. I really mean that, Larry. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Surely I've earned the right to buy you dinner. <laughs> I'd like to. Well, you'd better or I'll start doing some talking. Blackmail? You said it. <laughs> All right. I'll meet you at Les Demago at 10.30. No way. Let's try the right bank, La Rotonde. That's a date. I'll see you. You better be there. <laughs> Shirts, uh, ties, yes, I, I think that's everything. Uh, come. Oh, it's, it's you, Rojansky. Are you coming with me? I am staying. Then we shall say goodbye. I do not have much time. The plane from Moscow leaves it. I do not think you'll be taking the plane. Are you insane? You know I've been recalled. Not precisely. What do you mean, not precisely? Moscow feels you have bungled badly. So, it's not the first time that an operation has been... First, you were duped by the American girl. You know she was a double agent? I know now. Did you know before she killed Leclerc? I was not in charge at that time. At that time? Now there are two murders that cannot be hushed up. The French police must have a murderer to satisfy the public. Then give them Carol. She... I only wish that we could. They want you. You have been chosen to be the murderer. I am replacing you as the head of this section. Ridiculous. I won't remain quiet. I have a lot I could and will say to the authorities if Moscow abandons me. Now you listen to me, Rojansky. I have no time to listen. Rojansky, wait. That hypodermic. Don't. Oh. Igor, you should be pleased to know that your dying will serve a good cause. Sorry, I'm late, but I... But? There were loose ends that had to be cleared up. Well, I thought maybe you decided against coming. Oh. After all, your job here is finished. Well, yes. Sit down, sir. <laughs> now that the Russians know you, there's nothing for you to do. It would be suicide to try to, huh? Oh, well, there are other things for me. Sure. Like getting married to a lovesick newspaper man, settling down, raising a family. Oh. <laughs> oh, I... I take it I'm your first Matahari. Mm-hmm. First and only. Mm. Well, Larry, we're very different from other women. In our business, you pay dues. And they're heavy payments. Hmm. I, I don't get it. I'm talking about sitting at another cafe on the left bank. Sitting and knowing that an agent named Wilson was going to be killed. Clumsily trying to warn him and finally deciding that his death was the way it had to be. Larry, that's a big payment. But you can forget about it now. It wasn't your fault. No. Forget about that and forget about Leclerc. Well, you had to... You see, 
It's even hard for you to say. I had to kill him. No, Larry, I have to keep on to justify those things. But, Carol, listen... Bye, Larry. Thanks for the champagne. But our dinner, I've, I've ordered dinner. At least have dinner with me. Oh, we both know what I have to do. If I ever change my mind, I promise I'll come running. Larry Fielding sat in La Rotonde and watched her walk away. He knew she was walking out of his life. For a moment, he toyed with the idea of running after her and joining her world of spies. He flirted with the idea that he might even be some sort of an American James Bond. But then, the waiter brought the dinner. And to his surprise, he was hungry. And that realization made him wonder about whether or not he was truly in love. I'll be back shortly. Who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? Your Better Business Bureau knows. I saw this perfectly darling mirror in the showroom, so I bought it. But when the truck came, they delivered this thing I never saw before. Now what am I going to do? Tell you what to do, madam. But who are you? I'm the man from the Better Business Bureau. Now, the first thing to do is to call the store manager and tell him what happened. But in the future, when your merchandise is delivered, you should examine the item before the delivery truck leaves. And if it's to be delivered from a warehouse, have a clear understanding with the dealer that unless it is the same as the sample shown to you, you will not accept it or... Pay for it. Oh, thank you. Just part of my job, madam, to help people with their shopping problems. Back in New York, Larry Fielding returned to his old job. An old friend and boss, Horace Finley, who was curious about what had happened in Paris. Finley kept pressing Larry to tell him about his Parisian adventure. Finally, Larry said, I'll tell you, Horace. In Paris, the food was good. Our cast included William Redfield, Joan Loring, Roger DeCoven, Ian Martin, and Chris Gampel. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I really killed that boy, you know? What did you say? I killed him, Mr. Murray. I waited for him in the hallway the next day, and I grabbed him. He was a scrawny kid. It was like ringing in the neck of a chicken. I do the same thing again, Mr. Murray, to the next guy who bothers my wife. They've got to learn. You lied to me. Every stinking word you told me was a lie. Don't be sore, Mr. Murray. I couldn't tell you the truth, could I? I mean, you wouldn't have taken the case, would you? Yes. I would have taken the case and told you to plead guilty with cause. No. I wanted you to get me off. And that's what you did. Look, Look I've got to go now, Mr. Murray. I just want to say thanks again. Oh, you think it's that simple? You think you can just walk out of here? Uh, Melanie's waiting for me. She likes to eat dinner early. The girl's always hungry. So long, Mr. Murray. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our Radio Mystery Theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... W-D-A-F, Kansas City.